Afternoon, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to this uh, session with uh, Professor Katie Hayward from Queen's University in Belfast. Um, my name is uh, Dario Kallig. I'm chair of the UK group in the Institute. And it really is a great pleasure to welcome you here. I think we all know Katie as one of the very great experts on what's happening in Northern Ireland. Um, all her work is invariably interesting, invariably stimulating, and uh, uh, with, I think, a very correct and strong uh, feeling about what's happening politically uh, in Northern Ireland. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Katie. Um, and to bring us up to date uh, on what's happening uh, in the North. Um, Katie will speak for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then I can take questions from people in the room and also from the people who are joining us on the Zoom platform. So it's over to you, Katie. Thank you very much, Dahi, for that kind introduction. I do hope what I'm going to say is interesting and stimulating. Um, it might take a little longer than 20 minutes, so um, apologies in advance That's for that, right. but at least you've been forewarned. <laughs> um, it's a great honor to be asked to speak at the IIA. Um, I, I'm very grateful for the work that you do, and um, for decades now I have enjoyed um, coming here, and it's a particular privilege to speak here. Um, so this morning, of course, um, I was zooming in to, to watch the webinar that you held on the announcement of the new commission. And I think the overall tone was one that was very somber and sober. And it's very clear that the European Union is having to make some very difficult decisions. Um, the elephant in the room that somebody pointed out was not mentioned was Trump. Um, and uh, when I was being asked um, very patiently actually for a title for this talk, um, I uh, decided to do so after the announcement of the election results in the States, and I very much felt that there was a need for some good news, <laughs> and hence the title. But of course, then the challenge of actually writing something that meets uh, the, uh, the claim of the title proved rather more challenging. Um, but this presentation comes at a time when polarization and extremism, um, both in Europe and in the States and closer to home, is on the rise. And in some ways, I think we can understand Northern Ireland very well if we think of it in terms of a place that is familiar with both of these things, polarization and populism or extremism. And for such reasons, I want to think not only about how we can keep Northern Ireland stable and perhaps make it into a good news story as um, Ireland, the UK and the US and Europe need right now, but also how to take lessons from Northern Ireland in managing extremism and polarization. Okay, so the next slide shows a good, uh, an image of the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Belfast Agreement is a manifestation of optimism. There's a sense that we're sort of at the end of optimism, but the Good Friday Agreement was of course the very opposite of that. And in so being, it was very much of its time. And I should say that Northern Ireland was of course 25, 26 years ago, very much a good new, I hope I haven't really broken it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was very much a good news story for the three governments, for the US, Ireland and the UK. Um, and this optimism, it fitted very much into the vibe of the 1990s with Blair, etc. In fact, um, I heard recently a talk given by Tom Fletcher, who's then um, uh, in Hartford College uh, before his elevation, um, and he was talking about foreign policy in the late 1990s under Blair um, as one in which the future of liberal democracy seemed bright, if not actually assured. Um, and that was, that was the vibe of the time. And after the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, uh, Tony Blair um, dispensed such assurance around the world in many ways, partly through interventions, um, many of which we would perhaps view differently nowadays, Denise Timor, Kosovo, Iraq even, but partly through also exporting that model of Northern Ireland um, as a successful peace process. Um, do you remember the talk about talking to terrorists as being a model? Um, I might call it pandering to paramilitaries, but that's another, another vein. Um, such confidence though, um, and a belief that Northern Ireland was a good news story was very much centered on saying, look at what we managed to end. Um, the focus was on the lack of violence, 
Little attention was focused at the time on the contradiction that we were all accepting, i.e. that the lack of violence that was being experienced now in Northern Ireland came along with it, <clears throat> a lack of democracy, or indeed lack of democracy such as we would all recognize proper liberal democracy. And the situation worsened with the St Andrews Agreement, which reflected, of course, the fact that by that time, the two largest parties were those who were closest to paramilitaries. So Northern Ireland was left with a situation in which we don't have the power to change our government. There's no holding to account our politicians in elections in the way that other liberal democracies might recognize. We have a legislature whose functioning can be vetoed by one party and an executive whose functioning in many ways depends on a carve up or at least the sharing out. Um, you get this if I get this. Northern Ireland is often at the sharp end of an ugly compromise. And some perhaps would argue that this will always be the case until such a time as unification. And some would argue that that is actually the underlying assumption of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Let's set that aside for a moment. But now I think it is time for Northern Ireland to be a different type of good news story. We need to move on from saying, look at what we ended, to saying, look at what we have enabled in Northern Ireland. And so I'm, this is a four sections of the talk. So um, what we can't assume anymore, um, also what needs to be enabled in Northern Ireland, and then some of those lessons that we might learn from Northern Ireland about dealing with extremism. Um, and then finally, where we might begin. So firstly, let's be realistic about what we can't assume anymore regarding the conditions for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, what has changed. Some of you have um, heard me talk about this before. So the underlying assumptions behind the Good Friday Agreement, I'm just highlighting 10 here as, as quickly as possible, conscious of the time. But of course, there was fundamentally the recognition of the value of devolution within the UK, the recognition that the UK was a multinational state, the importance of subsidiarity, um, and the idea that devolution in Northern Ireland was actually part of a bigger picture of upholding devolution within the UK. Common EU membership, um, UK and Ireland as friendly neighbours and partners in the European Union, that the two countries are on the common trajectory. This, of course, was useful not only for North-South cooperation, but also for the UK as a whole, all of the parts of the UK being within the single market. A joint UK-Ireland approach towards Northern Ireland um, had been well established, um, um, not least since the um, Anglo-Irish Agreement, the idea of these two kin states working hand in hand to enable unionism and nationalism to work hand in hand. Total commitment to the principles of democracy and non-violence. So this of course underpinned the multi-party talks um, and democracy was seen as the um, alternative to violence, you achieve your ends through democratic participation rather than through violence. The exercise of sovereign power in Northern Ireland would be done with rigorous impartiality, whichever government was doing so. Um, so this, of course, came in light of the paragraph with respect to constitutional change. And it was in the time assuring for nationalists they will be treated impartially by the UK government and for unionists in the future, they would be treated impartially by the Irish government. Um, also, the um, mutual observance of international law and dem domestic law upholding the rule, uh, domestic upholding of the rule of law was foundational. Why would you even question that? Um, again, this was there partly with an eye to the terrorists. UK commitment to the European Convention on Human Rights, you continued subscription to it. Interesting how late that came on in the process, and if you haven't seen it already, I'd recommend um, a paper by um, my colleague in Queen's, uh, Chris McCrudden, on where the, uh, where the commitments to rights uh, came in the original text of the Good Friday Agreement. Also, this commitment was part of a wish to internationalize Northern Ireland, of course. The assumption that the status quo was more predictable and stable than the alternative of unification was something um, uh, that was reassuring, I think, to all uh, governments concerned, uh, if not all parties. Um, fundamental assumption that the main parties um, in the two governments were different to those who were exercising power in Northern Ireland. And last but not least, a sense of ownership from the US and the EU about the Good Friday Agreement kept a sense of its importance for the two governments and also 
enabled good discipline in the executive itself, that they were being watched, that they were regularly being asked, um, um, being encouraged to uh, uphold the Good Friday Agreement. Okay, so as I say, these assumptions, um, we can no longer necessarily assume them to be there. And in so doing, this helps us to appreciate what has changed and, and the size of the challenge if we are to um, uh, enable good things to happen for Northern Ireland now. So first and foremost, um, we will see, with respect to the recognition of the value of devolution within the UK, um, I'm part of a UK constitutional monitoring group. Um, uh, we've produced six reports now on the state of um, the constitution in the UK, uh, and this was an additional one at the end of the term of parliament. Um, just noting in, in here how uh, devolution has been undermined actively by the British government um, in response to COVID, for example, the UK Internal Market Bill or Act um, uh, infamously. But even now, and I was mentioning this uh, the other day in the Royal Irish Academy, um, there are suspicions that still this new government, even though it upholds, you know, it's trying to have the Council of the Nations and Regions, etc., that there's a fundamental um, convenience to downplaying the significance of devolution. So the product um, regulation and metrology bill that's currently being debated um, does not yet have the consent of all uh, the devolved uh, regions and nations. And there is a concern that it's only that it's functioning will be uh, one that um, gives more, relies on secondary legislation. I, UK government ministers will use their powers in areas of devolved competence. No common EU membership anymore. And what is worse, uh, that the relationship with the EU is very clearly a line of political tension, one that is very clearly associated with community identities, of course. And it's also a practical challenge. Um, and these are very complicated arrangements for Northern Ireland. Um, we haven't yet implemented the Windsor framework um, and the, the coordination and communication difficulties that are going to be very acute. The joint Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, UK Ireland approach to Northern Ireland. Um, now we, of course, um, have experienced how difficult that has become. Um, we've had, again, infamous experience of um, anti-Irish prejudice, anti-British prejudice. Um, and uh, now the EU relationship is a factor in this. Um, this fundamental question as to whether the UK government will, and civil servants perhaps, will get out of the habit of thinking of Northern Ireland as a domestic concern and how much they'd be prepared to include Northern Ireland in some of their uh, engagement and liaison with the EU. Um, this is just, a, I love this image, as a sign of how bad things really did get. Just earlier this year, those separate photographs with the new executive, and there is hope now of, of a different, um, different mood music, if not a reset. Total commitment to the principles of democracy, I would argue that these have been completely unrealized and um, I will come back to this. Um, but if we look at um, the Council of Europe found it necessary to set out what they believe are the principles of democracy um, in significant detail. Um, and just to highlight one thing, principle nine on responsiveness, government, public institutions, public officials should be responsive to the legitimate expectations and needs of those whom they serve. In very little shape or form can we see this having been enacted in Northern Ireland, and I'll come back to this. Exercise of sovereign power in Northern Ireland with rigorous impartiality. Some of you know, some of you know I wrote something for the Constitution Society, arguing that this was, this was very much breached by the safeguarding the Union deal, and the fact that um, two international agreements, the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, um, British Irish Agreement underpinning it, and the um, Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland slash Windsor framework were attempting to be redeemed through negotiations, not between parties and the two governments, but between one party and one government. And I put that in italics there as just a sign that hopefully that's gone, but it has shaken foundations in many ways. Mutual observance of international law, again, all of these um, uh, issues, uh, these events are kind of infamous now, but um, that that habit of, in, of breaking the law, um, hopefully it's not there anymore, but I would say that even in the protocol implementation, there's dangers because we are quite familiar with being in a liminal zone or a sort of a grayness about what is actually required in implementing the law. 
and how strict these how strict um, an interpretation is meant to be offered. Um, and we may come back to that in Q&A, if you wish. And then a commitment to ECHR. Again, I've got this on italics because we know how close um, and how the UK government really did breach ECHR. Um, and um, even though the new government is very clear about wanting to continue to subscribe to it, absolutely. Um, there's still some concerns in Northern Ireland, in particular in relation to Article 2 of the um, Windsor framework that actually there's some pushback on this from the UK government. And we also know that in the Conservative Party, I think there will continue to be flux and, and they, they can speak very clearly about doubting the, the, um, the legitimacy of the ECHR and wanting to leave them. We should be aware of that. Um, I don't think any of us could think that the, that the status quo is predictable today. Um, um, it's probably more predictable and stable than the alternative, but still, it's one to be alert to. Again, the question of um, the degree to which the two parties, uh, the parties in government in the South, are different to those in Northern Ireland, we will see. Um, and then that sense of ownership over the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. We have good reason to doubt how um, sincerely committed maybe the new, um, the incoming president in the States is uh, committed to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And we know the EU has an awful lot of other things and other concerns on its on its plate as well. So the foundations have been shaken, and we need to recognise that even though we have um, uh, uh, the Labour Party uh, in power uh, with more uh, uh, conventional uh, responses to international law and implementing it, and indeed to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, that we aren't facing a back to normal. Um, they can't revert to doing things as they were doing before, um, which has entailed a lot of goodwill. Something more fundamental is needed. So three things in terms of what to enable. I'm going to share with you some data from various uh, surveys and polls. So Northern Ireland is not a proper democracy by any means. Um, and the extremes, we might say that European countries have been struggling and in some cases failing to keep at bay um, are embedded in Northern Ireland and in some ways we have a little way of keeping them out. Um, they sit together in government and are guaranteed a place in it. Um, what do we need from democracy for functioning government, uh, functioning democratic governance? Um, I've set them out already from the um, Council of Europe. And I would argue we don't have any of these um, in good quality in Northern Ireland. Um, and this is because at the time of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, some might say for good reason, the governments at the time, and perhaps including the states too, prioritised what we'd call input legitimacy, i.e. who is making decisions, over output legitimacy, i.e. the quality of what is being decided. Um, and it's worth noting that this is contrary to what people wanted to see. So this is back from the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey of 1998, so after the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And you can see there very clearly um, that the priorities of citizens were increasing employment and improving the health service. Um, and this continued to be the case, and we see this in the Life and Time Survey, the economy and health continue to be top priorities until we stopped asking that question in NILT because it was so obvious what people were going to say and indeed it was so different from what we were getting in in government at the time this is a slightly this is a different poll this is from our um post-brexit governance um polling that we do on um on the Windsor framework and this year we'd asked people to rank in order of importance one to ten uh, these issues of concern that could be relevant to politics um, and through fairly crude form of waiting here, we can see still health and social care, the economy, employment still by far um, outweigh all other issues in terms of people's concern. Um, constitutional status is about midway there. And what's very interesting, uh, as a slight aside, is the way that the Windsor framework effects and the question of immigration um, relate to the, like a second order issue Oftentimes people are more concerned about that, also place the constitutional status in their top three, um, and they are almost exclusively um, um, strongly unionist. Um, another thing of note, um, as an aside, 
is that the number of people putting immigration in their top three issues of concern um, has doubled since our poll in February. Um, community relations consistently at the bottom of people's list of concerns. Um, and this is different data again from the general election survey um, that we conducted there um, in October. And you can see there's grounds for optimism here. So a clear majority of people, um, 86%, are saying they have friendships that stretch across identity divides, and they believe, majority believe, that relationships are improving between communities in Northern Ireland. Um, a, a plurality think that it's time to remove the peace walls. Where you see some doubt, it's about whether parties in the executive are committed to healing and reconciliation. And that's partly because the question is, well, are they incentivized to doing so? Where does political capital come from for them? So only a third of people believe that. And this is looking at that community relations question um, um, over time. So this is from the Life and Time survey data as well. So it's it's a, if you read it so that um, the unbroken yellow line is people saying things are better than they used to be or they, they were five years ago. The dotted yellow line is people saying they will be better in five years. And the red unbroken line, things are worse than five years ago. The broken line, things will be worse in five years time. So a few things to note, which is quite interesting. It's great to have data across 25 years. So one thing we see in 1998, how optimistic people were that things will be better in five years time. That all ties with that sense of hopefulness that we saw with the, with the agreement being signed, but how quickly things descended. Um, and how quickly people thought that things were worse, actually, um, than, than they had been five years beforehand. Um, that in 2002, um, this is just after the institutions have been suspended. Um, you can see there how close the, the sort of pessimism is on, on all fronts. And what that sort of reflects, too, is uh, the size of the don't knows. So like half of people saying they, they really felt unsure. That period of direct rule is one where optimism increased, but of course, there was also economic growth at that time. Um, in 2019, um, we can see this real, the real gloom, the Brexit gloom, perhaps, <laughs> saying that things uh, will be, will be, uh, um, a very decline. People think, people think that things will be better in five years' time. And now, our most recent survey at the end of 2023. Um, there's a sense maybe they will be better, but we'll, we'll see what, what our um, survey says. We'll be producing the results in the spring. Um, this is a, something about the, to show how important the institutions are in people's confidence. Um, so we've been doing polling on the Windsor framework uh, for th uh, since spring 21. And uh, what's really fascinating with this slide is to show how um, increasingly um, there's been an increasing difference, a diminishing difference between those who are positive and those who are negative about the impact of the Windsor framework on political stability. And of course, the key difference came first with the Windsor framework. We had the new UK EU relationship, a bit of a um, um, the mood music change then perhaps. But then when the institutions got up and running after the safeguarding union deal this year, that's when you saw a significant rise. So if they're there, people begin to think that has, um, they think differently about the impact of um, external things on political stability as well. Um, but there is a note of caution here. Um, and this is the question of well, the institutions are there in and of themselves. That's good to see. It makes people feel a little bit more confident. Uh, but um, <laughs> what are they doing? And um, really striking here is how um, there is a lack of confidence in the effectiveness of the institutions regarding the Windsor framework. Um, and we can also see the particular skepticism of strong unionists and indeed slight unionists when it comes to um, uh, the effectiveness of these institutions um, on a matter on a matter that particularly unionists see is hugely significant and constitutionally significant. And this is from the general election survey again, most recent poll. And you can see from this 
um, how low the levels of satisfaction are with the MLAs and with the executive. And when we dig into this, it's particularly from unionists, particularly dissatisfied um, and very low confidence that the assembly won't collapse again. So how can we address that? Well, review and reform the agreements. And so we see, um, since we've been asking the last four years or so about people's opinions on the Good Friday Agreement, um, you can see how um, what a difference it made in really having the, uh, the on-off of the institutions functioning. So by the time it came to 2023, we've seen a real drop in those who think the agreement remains the best basis for governing Northern Ireland and a rise in those thinking that it needs some change. And where the, where the adjustment happened in that is the rising number of nationalists who think we need to see reform with the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Um, and when we asked people a couple of years ago about what they wanted to see reformed, where we saw near consensus is in relation to the Bill of Rights. Notably there, we see a majority of unionists also wanting that, which is contrary to a lot of the political discourse. Um, we also see a majority of people want weighted votes for um, a rated majority rather than cross-community consent required for key votes in the Assembly, and also a majority want um, a civic forum. Um, and this is just to sort of show this question of review and reform of the agreement is nothing new. So over 10 years ago, the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly um, was seeking, was recommending that there be a review of the agreement and the St Andrews Agreement, um, and indeed argued that there should be a mechanism for formally reporting on the implementation of the agreements in all aspects. They also asked a call for the Civic Forum. More recently, of course, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee looked into this in detail, took a lot of interesting evidence on this, and their report um, was recommending, again, an independently-led review of the operation of the agreement, um, and also made specific recommendations about votes for those key issues around um, the election of a speaker, um, and how the first ministers should be appointed, and they too asked for a citizens' assembly um, rather than a uh, civic forum. Um, I should recognise that there was a minority report issued by the DUP members of the committee who disagreed with the need for reform of the Good Friday Agreement. And then last but not least, of course, uh, the Irish government has also been calling for such a review and reform, um, um, and including around the way that the institutions function, such as about the use of Petition of Concern and Bill of Rights. Um, we do have a review coming up. So this may be a bit of a test for whether it's possible to have a review in Northern Ireland that is actually about the issue on 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 paper rather than whatever might be in, in the atmosphere at the time. So can we have a review um, about proper functioning and whether things are um, producing the out results that they were intended to um, rather than it getting into the weeds of identity and ideology? So as I'm sure you all know, we have this democratic consent vote coming up in the assembly. It'll happen by um, 17th of December at the very latest. And in the event, uh, this is on the articles five to 10 of the Windsor framework. And in the event that there is only a simple majority in favor of supporting the retention of articles five to 10, uh, there will be an independent review that the UK government commissions on this. So originally, when the protocol was agreed and the Article 18, which provides for this democratic consent vote, was included, um, it was said that um, this review um, could take up to two years uh, to report, and it would be on the functioning of the protocol and the implica implications of any decision to continue or terminate alignment. However, with the Safeguarding the Union deal, this review um, may now include consideration of any effect of the Windsor framework on the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. So you can see where this may go. Um, it also includes Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market. Um, and to add to the um, complexity for um, any person who's um, lucky enough to be appointed independent chair of this review, uh, that they must produce their report on this by the end of June. The Secretary of State then brings those recommendations to the to Parliament, 
you know, also report them to the Northern Ireland Assembly and also to the UK EU Joint Committee, not that the EU is committed or re required to do anything in response to those. So this, this will be a test. Um, and in, in theory, it will enable us to see the value of a proper independent review on the functioning of something that uh, is extremely important in Northern Ireland. Um, another thing to enable good things to grow in Northern Ireland is to tell the truth. So how that review goes on the Good Friday, on the Windsor framework um, and how it's what's put into it and how it's responded to. So in theory, it should entail consultation with wide groups in society. Um, a lot of that will depend on the kind of information that people will have. Um, and when we asked in our poll in June, we had the statement about the Windsor framework um, and the safeguarding the union deals being oversold. You can see here that amongst unionists, they all believe that the Windsor framework was oversold. So that adds to the skepticism uh, not just about the Windsor framework, but also about political representatives themselves. Um, and of course, it's not surprising that they were saying this because Gavin Robinson, by then leader of the DUP himself, admitted that the safeguard in the union deal had been oversold. So there's most wariness amongst unionists. And the reason this is of particular significance is because unionists see um, Brexit, as I mentioned before, as constitutionally significant. So again, apologies if you've seen this before, but this is from the Life and Time survey. So we've asked since 2016 if Brexit makes United Ireland more likely, and there's really interesting trends here. So after 2020, so essentially after the after the protocol, um, we saw a jump in unionists and neither thinking that it makes United Ireland more likely. Um, and then in our last survey in 2023, we saw how whilst neither and nationalists are slightly declining in their um, expectations of Irish unity as a result of Brexit, we see unionists are in the opposite direction. So more than half of them now think that it's made United Ireland more likely. So any information on this is crucially important and the way it's presented and the way it's connected to Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market, etc. And so um, one thing to really be alert to is how people want to see factual information. This is from the, the our Windsor Framework poll from October. And across the board, people want factual information on the Windsor Framework. And interestingly, um, we put it in the question, jointly presented by the UK and the EU. That is the way in which it could get traction and be um, have, have um, retained the confidence of people of all different communities on this. So what needs to be enabled in Northern Ireland functioning democratic government, more difficult than it sounds, a review and reform of agreements on the basis of facts and the truth to be told, um, including about the Windsor framework. Um, um, we may discuss that in Q&A. Um, what to learn? So as I was saying, Northern Ireland is a place where we've had to manage extremism and polarization. And I think there are some lessons um, for, for wider liberal democracies. Um, and of course, particularly on the island of Ireland, we're very acutely aware of, first and foremost, the, the power of words and um, the sense of unease around, um, uh, sorry, very acutely aware of tensions in society and the risks of uh, violence in relation to that. So my first recommendation is respect the power of words. Northern Ireland is a place dominated by two populist parties, and we know how incredibly powerful words can be, and partly because for those parties, their roots are in protest, of course. Um, words or phrases are listened to in terms of how people, um, uh, how they resonate with people's suspicions of how things actually are. And so there are many examples of this, but if we think of Arlene Foster's comment about if you feed a crocodile, it'll keep coming back for more. That resonated because nationalists thought, well, that's definitely how she views us. That's just a sign of how things actually are. And similarly with Michelle O'Neill's comment that there was no alternative to the IRA's armed campaign. Again, that resonates with people's suspicions that, well, she's very close to, to, to terrorists. Lessons recently in Northern Ireland um, about the power of words across reaching across the Irish border, 
um, came from um, the Minister for Justice's claim about people crossing the Irish border. And I know that's small font there, but this is just to show how interesting it is that that resonated with people's suspicions of how things actually are. So in our comments from the Windsor Framework poll that we conducted in June, the issue of immigration, this comments people can write anything they like, and they, and they do, um, at the end of our poll. And from all our polls up to February, only like a few comments were made around immigration, and that just exploded in June. Um, and these are some of the comments that were left. And essentially, it's about um, seeing the Irish government always having been happy with having a hard border if it's on their own terms. So it makes a mockery of the need for the protocol at all. Um, and so this sense of hypocrisy, etc. So it was a really, it was very interesting to see on the ground how that that um, that particular comment had been picked up and really um, compounded people's distrust in the Windsor framework. Um, so there are lessons, and I would just, in particular, would say any any politician referring to something that's common sense. It's also deliberately intended to resonate with people's suspicions of how things actually are, and it's a big red flag. Um, another lesson is don't allow the lines of lawfulness to be blurred. Obviously, we may say with talking to terrorists, et cetera, that those lines of lawfulness were being blurred quite deliberately and strategically back in the 90s, um, but they shouldn't be blurred anymore if you want a functioning democratic um, uh, uh, institution and state and society. Um, so we saw a lot of this recently, this habit of listening to those who, and responding to those who threaten violence above those who are offering something constructive. Um, and we saw this very particularly around the debate on the protocol. Uh, and again, infamously, there's a lot of infamous <laughs> events uh, during the Brexit negotiations and debate around the protocol. Um, it seemed that those who were threatening violence were those who were most most responded to, the most powerful. And we often had this, we had this strange situation in which an agitator in, in loyalism had his words effectively repeated by the leader of the largest unionist party, which were then repeated by the, by the British government, ministers of the British government. So who was in control of that language? Um, and where was it taking them and who was being placated by this? Um, there was this sense of trying to, every each of those actors were trying to manipulate a larger or more powerful actor. In the case of the British government, they were trying to man manipulate or change the EU. Um, all of this rested on the threat of violence. Um, and this goes hand in hand with diminishing the status of evidence and facts and overselling the necessary compromise. But this was not confined to one side. And we should be very clear that a lot of unionist scepticism about the agreement is because they believe it was based on the threat of violence. Um, and this is just another comment from, from um, a poll in June about, there's very clear that this, this narrative is there that the Windsor framework exists because of the threat of violence from Republicans. Um, last but not least on this, don't take civil society for granted. So it's, it's pretty well known, I think, that when the agreement was made and the prisoners were released, one of the consequences of that was pushing out um, those, particularly women, from the community and voluntary sector who had been keeping things going um, and who had been addressing the real, real needs of local communities rather than maybe single identity ones. Um, and unfortunately, in more recent times, the term community worker has become, in some cases, at, at risk of being seen as a euphemism for something else. Um, and the community sector, for example, around the infamous <laughs> Strategic Investment Fund a decade ago, has been seen as a means of empire building or keeping control. Um, and the intention has been to persuade um, men to achieve their goals by non-violence. So giving them a status in their community, but through other means, i.e. through money rather than through crime. Um, and this has led to situations which, by dint of their association with paramilitarism, to keep them away from overt paramilitary activity, they have still been able to exercise power, i.e. they have money to hand out, be that from EU peace funds, be that from 
and Irish reconciliation funds or elsewhere. Um, looking to the challenge of um, extremism, because these dynamics are similar, um, the advice would be don't be more responsive to those who threaten violence than to those who are actively contributing to the work of peace and community building. And to reiterate, more often than not, these women, these people are women rather than men. And in that sense, the calls for the civics forum or citizens assembly are so right. And they will continue to be resisted by the parties because civil society has to be disruptive and has to be challenging to those structures of, um, uh, of power and control that have um, got some people into their into elected position in, in, in recent times. And I really like this quote from the sociologist Alan Wolf, who writes about the value of the social sciences um, uh, in, in dealing with the complexities of modern society. Um, and he talks about civil society, if understood where people pause to reflect on the moral dilemmas they face, being necessary if individuals are to possess those capacities of agency that will enable them to make rules as well as to follow them. And this was this is a nice little sense of what we are trying to do in enabling civil society. And it's something that's been so neglected um, in recent times. So where to begin? This isn't a long slide. This is very short. <laughs> I think we, we can begin back in the Good Friday Agreement, and some of you heard me say this before. But this, this was an expression of optimism and hope, and it was also an expression of liberal democratic principles. We were actually there 25 years ago, uh, thanks to some people who are in this room. Um, but liberal democracy, as it was, was stymied even in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement by the predominance of a particular version of nationalism, British and Irish, um, as a lens through which that conflict or indeed that extremism, uh, or that populism was viewed and understood and responded to. In actual fact, the Good Friday Agreement was much more radical than we allowed it to be. It was intended, of course, to be about enabling and not just about ending something. Um, it was also intended to be about the UK and Ireland keeping their own houses in order. And just to read out this point here from the, from the declaration of support from the two governments. So both governments re reaffirm their total commitment to the principles of democracy and nonviolence. Um, and they also reaffirm their commitment to the principles of partnership, equality and mutual respect and to the protection of civil, political, social, economic, and cultural rights in their respective jurisdictions. And as I say, this isn't the first time I've said this, but I really do think in responding to the challenges that we are all facing at the moment, the secret is right here. Um, and I loved it when Catherine Day said this morning, um, here on this stage, for the European Union, in respect to its own principles of liberal democracy and its own values, that it should stop preaching about it and actually do it. And it's so true here as well. So here at this point, um, uh, we see where Northern Ireland can be turned around into a sustainable good news story for the next generation. And it's also at this point on these principles um, at which we can see how a slide into illiberalism and to populism might yet be averted in Ireland and might not yet be repeated again in the UK. Thank you.